What's going on, guys? Welcome back to WWE Network and Chill, where I Graham Gs and Matthews break down all the original content they watch on the WWE Network. And today we're talking the latest original special surrounding the 30 days of the dead man on the WWE Network. This one being called The Mortician, The Story of Paul Bear. Now, like I said, they've been doing specials for Taker now for the last couple of weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, we had the Untold episode of The Undertaker and Randy Orton, uh, kind of covering their 2005 rivalry, which was fantastic. We had that 30-minute special last week called Meeting the Undertaker, featuring stories from many, many people, from Stone Cold and The Rock to Shawn Michaels and Triple H and so many more people, um, talking about how the first time they met The Undertaker. And uh, this episode was incredibly different than anything we've seen so far in the month leading up to Taker's 30-year anniversary at Survivor Series, as this you know, hour-long special, as it came around to being, it was around 56 minutes to be exact. Covered the life and times of Paul Bear, A.K. Will Moody, uh, better known as Percy Pringle on the independent scene, Paul Bear in WWE, the manager of The Undertaker, Kane, Mankind, and others um, in the company. This was fantastic. This was fucking great. I know they've been posting and uh, rather uh, airing trailers for this big documentary um, in the days leading up to its release earlier today. I know this video is going up a little late. That's just because it took me a little while to get through this. I was busy this morning, but it was well worth the wait. This was really, really, really good. Now, I know I've heard bits and pieces of Bear's story as Percy Pringle, um, as, you know, obviously Well Moody, the person, um, elsewhere before, but obviously he passed away in 2013. So it's been a long time since he's done a podcast or talked about his career. Um, they featured a lot of Bear footage here. Uh, of him talking about his upbringing and career and coming back to the company and stuff like that. It was footage either filmed in 2013 from when he passed away in March of that year or 2011 or 2012. He came back to the company initially in 2010. So it was at least around that period of time that he filmed all this footage for a future documentary, I would have to assume. And it took seven years for them to make it unless there was another, not a network special, but like a DVD documentaries, whatever, on Bear's career prior to this point, but I don't remember there being one. So this had footage and, uh, you know, interviews with Bearer himself from before he passed. Undertaker, of course, which was great. And maybe that's why they waited so long to do this. Just because Taker really hasn't been a talking head as a regular on these documentaries, on these DVDs and stuff, on, on specials like this, at all, really up until recently. Now, I know he was like, they featured some quotes from him, on the Triple H documentary around that same time in 2013. We've seen bits and pieces of Taker here and there in documentaries like this in interview form outside of the Undertaker persona, but not very much. But he's been doing a lot of this stuff recently, ever since really the Broken School Sessions episode of Taker, part one, from almost exactly a year ago. And then, of course, we got the... The Last Ride documentary they did on the network earlier this year, which was fantastic. He was all over that. He did interviews with many, many websites. The guy didn't do interviews for fucking 30 years, and now he's on, like, every website imaginable. <laughs> so, you know, he's all over the place now. So it was logical to assume he'd be a part of this. But maybe that's why they waited so long. They didn't want Taker to do a sit-down. Or maybe he didn't want to do it. You know, sit down and talk about Bear out of character until it was kind of appropriate to do so, and the time it could not have been better. Heading into the 30-year anniversary of the Undertaker character at Survivor Series 2020. So Taker's all over this thing. We hear from Kane a lot, Glenn Jacobs, uh, Mick Foley, a.k.a. Mankind, Bruce Pritchard, which was logical given that Pritchard was the first manager for um, Taker before Paul Bear, and he also played a, a crucial role in bringing Bear into the company in 1990. We hear from Michael P.S. Hayes, who was really, really close with Bear prior to his WWE career. So I thought this whole thing was really, really well done. So I thought I was watching the wrong thing initially. Not the first thing that we see on the special, because of course they always open these specials with like the quick comments about Bear and how great he was and his legendary career and stuff like that. The actual documentary opened with footage of JFK's assassination from 1963. And I'm thinking... Am I watching the wrong special here? Like, why is this here? So we hear from Paul Bear himself, again, in footage that was recorded pre, obviously, before his death in 2013. It was around that time. It very well may have been recorded earlier that year, which is crazy. So thankfully, they were able to get a lot of, you know, uh, stuff from him regarding his upbringing, his career, his WWE stuff, and everything else. 
So we talked about how JFK's assassination, which happened around the time that he was like seven or eight or uh, seven or eight years old, he said, had a big influence on him, as that was kind of like his first memories of death and funeral parlors and stuff like that, as it was that same year that his grandfather passed away. So that really had a big impact on him. Those were his first memories, again, of death and being at a funeral home. So, for whatever reason, he was always obsessed with death. Not in like an emo, weird, creepy type of way. But he always wanted to give people a funeral. Not just people, but like animals, whether it be like a dead frog on the road or a dog that passed away in the neighborhood. He always wanted to give everything a funeral. So his childhood dream, I guess, growing up, was wanting to be a funeral director. How many kids actually say that? You know what I mean? Like, oh, I want to work in a funeral home. Paul Bear did. Bill Moody did. Or Will Moody, excuse me, did. Um, so we also, around that time, found wrestling. Specifically fell in love with Gulf Coast Wrestling around where he lived in Alabama. He would help put up rings. He just really wanted to do anything to get into the business. He really wanted to break into the business and be a part of it. So we also hear from Michael P.S. Hayes, a member of the Fabulous Freebirds, of course. And he talks about how much of a fan, at heart, Paul Bearer was of this business. They trained themselves, they would go to shows... And they would kind of like slam each other on the concrete and on the hard ground and stuff like that until they kind of got it. So what I did not know, and again, I learned a lot about Paul Bear in this documentary. Most of this may have been common knowledge, and I'm, I'm sure this was all public knowledge already. I did not know most of this. I do not do my research most of the time on Paul Bear. I do not know a lot about Paul Bear beyond his WWE stuff. So hearing all this I thought was fascinating, at least to me. So he basically trained himself. He was a wrestler before he was a manager. I did not know that. He used to cut grass as a kid in, in order to buy the wrestling magazines. And he also served for four years in the U.S. Air Force. Again, something I did not know. He eventually obtained his wrestling license. That love for wrestling never really went away. In 1974. And both he and Hayes kind of caught the eye of the legendary Mephisto. Now, there is a Mephisto. I'm not all that familiar with who Mephisto is. I know the name sounds familiar, at least to me. So, there is a Mephisto out there now. Um, who's around 50 years old. So it must have been his father or something like that. I'm not exactly sure. But either way, Mephisto asked Bear about being a manager. And, and Percy didn't really know how to take it. I mean, his, his name eventually became... Didn't, didn't really know how to take it. And his name eventually became Percy Pringle, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, I, I'm, I'm bouncing around here between calling him Paul, Paul Bear, you know, Will, Bill, um, Percy, whatever. So Mephisto asks Bear about becoming a manager. And he didn't know how to take it. He thought, is he saying that my wrestling is bad? Am I more valuable in this role? I don't really know how to take it, but I'll give it a shot. So he eventually adopted the name of Percy Pringle. They didn't say where the name came from. Unless he did and I missed it. I don't think they ever talked about the origin of the name Percy Pringle, but it just worked. So also around that time, in 1978, he married his wife, Diane. So it was around that point he had to make a choice. What's going to be the best career move for me? Because I'm loving what I'm doing in wrestling, but it's not paying the bills. It's not paying me a lot of money, but I'm enjoying what I'm doing. Or can I just do an office job, an actual job, a funeral, director, parlor, whatever um, type of job, and that's what I can make money off of. Because I'm having a kid now, I'm married now, I kind of got to look out for more than just myself. So what's the best choice to make here? So as a result, he became a funeral director, and he took some time off from wrestling. Though he did return to the business in 1985, this time in Florida. He actually managed, which again, I did not know. There's a lot of things in this documentary that I did not know. Uh, managed Lex Luger for the first time. Or managed Lex Luger in Luger's first match in the business. Which is cool. Um, he also worked really closely with Rick Rude. And that was actually, I believe, the first person that he managed. And he called their chemistry perfect together. So the two of them took Texas by storm. And he was always adamant about playing second fiddle to whoever he was with. Because he didn't want to be the focal point of that act. He wanted to let the wrestler really be the focal point and add to it however he could. Which is the right approach to take. And I really, really commend that and respect that. Again, another thing I never knew. He was the first manager ever. And not only the first manager, but was the manager for The Undertaker. Not in WWE, but a couple of years before WWE. Um, I th want to say in 1987, I think this was, and Taker's name at the time was Texas Red. He managed Taker in his first official pro match ever 
in world-class championship wrestling, WCCW, in the Sportatorium in Texas. In his first match, none other than against Bruiser Brody, who just beat the shit out of The Undertaker. And, and Bear was essentially there not to really serve as a manager for Taker, or then known as Texas Red, but really to help him back up the ramp, because he was hurting afterward. But he endured that punishment, and he was willing to uh, make it work, and that was really his way of kind of paying his dues. So Taker eventually became the Punisher. He kind of worked with him a little bit there. I'm not sure how long the you know, alliance stuck. Probably not too, too long. But he was there for Taker's first bro match, he said. Which, again, blows my fucking mind. And it really makes me sad because if Taker was still here today... Uh, I'm sorry, not Taker, but if Paul Bearer was still around today, he would be a perfect person to have at that upcoming 30-year anniversary of Taker um, at Survivor Series. So... Anyway, around this t- same time, Pear, uh, Paul Bear was really, or Percy Pringle at this point, was strongly considering again getting out of the business. He was in Texas, you know, working with world class at the Sportatorium and whatever, but he strongly considered getting out of the business and moving his entire family back home to Alabama because it was working and he was, you know, he was successful, but he wasn't making a lot of money and he really had to make another choice here. What's the best thing for my family? And his wife said, You're not going to give up on your dream. And she was very supportive of his pro wrestling career. So it was around that time that he got in touch with Vincent McMahon. Vince McMahon himself. Junior, not senior. And Vince, he said, knew of his work as Percy Pringle as a manager on the independent scene. So he met him right before Christmas. I think on December 21st, he said. And he said he remembers the dates because his wife's... The anniversary with his wife was like the next day. On December 22nd or whatever. So we met him... He met Vince at Titan Towers in Stamford, Connecticut, uh, a couple days before Christmas. And they kind of sat across from each other, and Vince went over his resume. And Vince found out from reading his resume that Bearer, then known as Percy Pringle, used to be a funeral director. And he laughed about it. And Percy's like, why are you laughing? Like, why is that funny? Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Am I getting a job? Like, what's going on here? So he left that day with a contract. And he didn't know why. They thought it was so funny that he used to be a funeral director and why it worked and blah, blah, blah. But Vince liked him so much, he enjoyed his work so much, that he offered him a contract on the spot. So we actually see a picture of the contract here during the documentary, and it's dated December 28th, 1990. And we also see a bunch of calendars and like little books and stuff with dates. And that might have belonged to WWE, but I thought it might have been Percy's. It might have been, um, it might have been Will's, I'm not exactly sure. But it, it looked like it was it was Moody's, which is pretty cool. So anyway, um, he left that day with a contract. And Brother Love at the time, A.K. Bruce Pritchard, of course, was the one managing Taker when Taker first came into the company at Survivor Series 1990. And he didn't really, not that he didn't like it, he was decent in the role, but he had other obligations behind the scenes with production and stuff like that. And he wanted to stay in the office. He wanted to kind of stick to that side of things. In WWE needed someone to manage Taker to kind of replace Brother Love, so they chose Bear, which is why it fucking worked. So when Bear came into the company, Percy Pringle, and again, I'm jumping all over the place with the name thing here. I'm confusing my own self. When he came into the company to offer to, to kind of, you know, he, he wasn't there for the spot of being Taker's manager. He was just there for a job, period. To make this thing work, get a contract, make some money, and avoid having to move his entire family back to Alabama. He had no idea that Vince had in mind. He laughed at the idea. He found out later that Vince laughed at the discovery that Barry used to be a funeral director or was a funeral director was because they needed a manager for Taker. So it just kind of worked out perfectly. It was the perfect fit. And that's exactly what they did. So what they did was they introduced him on the January 28th, 1991 episode of Superstars with Brother Love there calling Paul Bear Brother Bearer. And, and, you know, naming himself Paul Bearer. So the name actually came from Animal of Legion of Doom, of the Road Warriors. He was backstage getting his makeup done or whatever. And they were going through names of what to call Percy Pringle because Percy Pringle was too wrestling. It was too Southern wrestling, which it's a great name. But if he's going to be with Taker, it's probably not going to work as well. So Animal was like joking. Ha ha, what about Paul? Paul Bearer. Like, isn't that funny? That was a Vince impersonation. And Pritchard's like... We got it. That's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. So they wanted him to change his look to kind of model Gomez Adams, Pritchard said, from the Adams family, which 
when I saw the side by side picture, I guess that makes sense. I never really thought about it like that before. I'm like, holy shit, that's perfect. And that's what he did. And Bear was a little hesitant because he really loved the bleach blonde, Bobby Heenan esque hair, um, like typical wrestling manager hair. He really liked his look, but he had to change it for this Paul Bear character, and he went along with it, and it worked. Um, he had to paint his face white to really bring out, like, the raccoon eyes type of look. So it worked. And, and it worked very well, obviously. And, of course, their chemistry was perfect right from the get-go. And Pritchard even said that it was kind of hard to tell the difference sometimes between Bill Moody and Paul Bear. Um, so he actually served as the actual manager for Taker outside of the ring, not just as a manager oh, accompanying him to the ring, and they go their separate ways, like booking hotels, booking rental cars, going everywhere, like driving the rental cars, going wherever Taker needed to go, like helping organize that stuff, which you don't ordinarily see nowadays, but it was a big thing back then, and that's how close they were. But they were on opposite sides of the spectrum. Taker brought up how, you know, Bearer would, you know, cut these promos, with a high-pitched voice, and whatever, I can't really do it. Um... Be super loud, super obnoxious, talk a lot with a high-pitched voice. But when Taker talked, which wasn't often back then, it was very slow, very methodical, very deep. And that, that was terrible to an impersonation on my part. Taker's voice is just like no one else's. So it just worked. It was a combination that just fucking worked, you know? So at the same time, Bear felt naked without having without having anything in his hands. He used to carry around a cane, I believe, as Percy Pringle on the independent scene outside of WWE. So he felt like he needed something in his hands. So he pitched the idea, I think it was his idea, to carry around an urn. And it, again, it just worked. So he got one from one of the funeral homes that he was working at or whatever. And he brought it to TV. They incorporated it into storylines many, many times from that point forward. And again, it, was, it just worked. So we went on to beat Hulk Hogan for the WWE Championship on almost the exact one-year anniversary of when he was introduced to WWE, um, to the WWE Universe on the WWE scene at Survivor Series 1991. Of course, he wanted to drop the championship two days later, but he did become a world champion in his technically rookie year in WWE. And I think he was still undefeated at that point. And Taker even said that he doesn't know if his character would take off had it not been... You know, had it not been for Paul Bear. So Bear, it was kind of like a rocket ship just kind of took off from there. They had the rocket fuel. It was off to the races from that point forward. Bear admitted that he was really intimidated to be interviewed by Regis Philbin at WrestleMania 7. Now they're kind of backtracking a little bit. That WrestleMania 7 was the spring of 1991. They just talked with the Hogan title win in the fall of 91, but that hardly matters. He always wanted to work MSG. He got to work MSG. His, his thing always was, if I could work MSG tomorrow, I could die a happy man. My career is over. And he got to work MSG multiple times. He got to do a very special entrance for SummerSlim 1992 in the Hearst and driving it out. He never thought being in front of that many people would ever happen for him, but it did. And it was a really, really cool experience. He was really blown away by all the people that were there for that show in Wembley Stadium for SummerSlim 1992. So fast forward to around 90, 90, 1996, there was a feeling in the back that Bear and Taker had kind of run their course as a pairing. They had been together by that point for over five years. And the feeling was, was that Bear was kind of holding Taker back from kind of reaching that next step, evolving his character. Taker had to talk more. And if Taker was going to talk more, didn't exactly need Paul Bear around. And Mankind was coming up. He had just debuted right after WrestleMania in a feud with Taker in 1996. So the idea was made to put Bearer with Mankind instead. And Taker, both Taker and Bearer, I guess, both Taker and Paul, thought it was premature, they thought it was too soon, there was still more for them to do, but obviously it worked out perfectly anyway. And Bearer, Mick Foley says, lent a lot of credibility to Mankind's character at that point. So then we get to 1997, the whole Kane thing, which we've you know heard to death here on these network specials, they talked about it in an untold and all this other stuff. They've done, they've done chronicles about it and shit like that. And it, as they should, I mean, it's it's one of, if not the greatest debut in company history. But they kind of reiterated it again here. Um, an abbreviated version of it, rather, of the story. So Taker was only supposed to be a one-off. Or Kane was only supposed to be a one-off for Taker. Taker was running through people like there was fucking no tomorrow. They would build someone up, Taker would beat him, and then they would move on. Kind of like Undertaker, the Underfaker, rather. At 1991's or 1994 SummerSlam, Taker beat him. It was fucking over. They built up giant Gonzalez to lose to Taker twice, and then it was over. 
Like, the whole purpose of some of these programs, of some of these people they brought in, were literally just to lose to Taker and then move on. Which is why I think part of the reason why Abyss did not sign the WWE in 07 was because they brought him in. They, The idea, I think, was for him to be brought in and work with Taker at that year's WrestleMania, probably WrestleMania 23 instead of Batista, and lose, obviously. And then that would have been it. And then his career would have floundered. like Kind of like Kali. Like Kali was brought in for a feud with Taker. And he was around for years after that, but he never really reached those same heights. So anyway, they, they told the story that there was a fire at the funeral home that Bearer worked at. They don't really get into all the specifics of who was related to who. I always thought Bearer was the actual father of Taker in storyline. He's not. He was just a funeral. Maybe he is. I, I don't know. I'm very confused. But they didn't say that here. Bearer worked at the funeral home that Taker burnt down as a kid, killing Kane, seemingly, and, and their parents. But no, actually, Kane did not die, and that was what brought on his debut um, at Bad Blood, no Mercy, uh, not No Mercy, but Bad Blood 1997. So even prior to that point, Taker and Bear are riding in the car together actually talked about potential scenarios about Taker having a brother and how they would do it, who would be good for the role. Kane and Bear were always close and always got along he always liked Kane Bearer did or Glenn Jacobs as he was known at the time because the fake Diesel thing was a flop the Isaac Yankum shit was a flop he had a lot of failed gimmicks in WWE back then and that spark that debut of his at Bad Blood 97 was the spark that everyone needed not only Kane to really kick off a character that would go on to be one of the greatest characters in company history but also revitalize Taker revitalize Bearer's career make them all relevant in the matter of just one night. And it was an amazing moment. It was a crucial point in all of their careers, Taker says. They then talk about Bearer backstage being a master rubber. They show a lot of footage of him like pretending to kiss Earl Hebner and still sitting in a chair while his ass was stuck in it. Just some really funny footage. Um, Kane tells a quick story, and I'm sure I've heard this before. I know I've heard this before, but Kane said <laughs> that... He, one time, you know, Bear used to drive the car a lot. And whenever he used to get out of the car and go into the arenas and whatever, he would wear a ski mask because he was masked at that point. He wouldn't walk around without a mask on. So when he was driving in the car, he would wear a ski mask. But usually it was Paul driving the car. At one point, Bear, I guess, didn't want to drive. I forgot what the story was. But Kane drove instead with the ski mask on. People noticed it was Kane driving the car. So Bear rolled down the window and said... Maybe this was on story time or something, but Bear rolled down the window and said, It's a miracle! Kane can drive! And I just died laughing after hearing that. I thought that was so great. You know, Mick Foley brought up it was very well liked backstage. So we get to the year 2000, and Taker became the American badass, of course. And Bear wasn't really needed as an on air character anymore. Kane also went on to do his own thing. Bear wasn't really needed as an on air persona 10 years, almost exactly 10 years removed from his WWE debut. Didn't really need him on the show anymore, so he did stick around in a backstage role, continued to help out backstage as a producer, stuff like that, and Gorilla. As much as he enjoyed being backstage, he loved even more being an on-air character. He missed doing that. But around 2001, his wife Diane was diagnosed with breast cancer. So he stayed home to take care of her, wanted to be home and take care of her, so he left the company. Didn't come back until 2004. Now, they're thinking of potential attractions for WrestleMania... 20 that year in March of 2004 and the return of the Undertaker I mean obviously Taker was still around but the Undertaker character the one that he debuted with was an idea Taker which I did not know actually was not in favor of this idea he did not want to come back as the phenom as the dead man he wanted to continue to do what he was doing he thought it was a step backward for his career to go back to being in the Undertaker so they eventually ended up doing it um, he eventually agreed to doing it, but only a new version of what the Taker character used to be. He still had shorter hair at the time. He had different attire, stuff like that. But one of the caveats in bringing back the original Taker character was that Paul Bearer had to be with him. So WWE reached out like six months early, like September of 03. I didn't know it was that early. I figured it was like early 04. No, they reached out in September of 2003. And I, I looked it up while I was watching the doc, and this has been pretty public knowledge for a long time now, but I never knew this story. So, Taker was still even on TV as the American Badass at that point. Taker was not renting off the show until November Survivor Series. So, they were planning the return of the Dead Man at WrestleMania 20 before Taker even took time off in November of 2004. I did not know that. So, they reached out to Bear, specifically Jim Ross, 
And Barris said no. Over the phone, he just told them no. Eventually, he would just ignore the phone calls, and they didn't really know why. So what happened was, he had a problem with his weight. Uh, he was home all the time due to his wife's cancer, taking care of her. He let his weight get out of control, and he ended up being 525 pounds, which is crazy. And he was really, really big if you look at the pictures. So we ignored WWE. Pritchard speculated he might have been depressed, which was probably likely. Based off the emails that they show here in the interactions between Bear and Jim Ross and Bear and the company, he said, he, he was like, I would love nothing more than to come back. And what they didn't cover, I guess, was that Bear was very critical of the company in his time away. They don't mention that here, but in looking it up further, um, while I paused the documentary and I looked it up, I guess Bear was very critical of WWE, some of their creative decisions and of Taker's direction and you know, kind of, not, you know, took some shot to take your praise Kane, thought the unmasking of Kane was dumb. But they wanted him back anyway. And it was probably because it was a taker decision and not a Vince decision. So anyway, he, he said in the email that he couldn't return without being too emotional, in his own words. And Vince was like, well, listen, if we're going to bring this guy back, before we can bring him back, we got to save his own life first. Because if we don't do something, he might do something dumb or whatever. So, Bear signed a contract to come back in October of 2003. Part of that contract was a signing bonus that covered the gastric bypass surgery that he needed to lose a lot of that weight. And they don't say they don't say how much weight that he lost from it, but again, in doing more research while watching the doc, it said that he lost 240 pounds from that gastric bypass surgery. I guess around WrestleMania time when he eventually came back, he was like you know, late 300s. He was like 390 pounds, which is still a lot, but it's better than 525. And that doesn't exactly, I guess it would, that, that's not 240. 240 pounds would be like uh, 300, like low 300s, high 200s. But he ended up losing a lot of weight was, was really the, the moral of the story here is the point of, that I'm trying to get to. Because uh, he looked good when he came back at WrestleMania. He couldn't get into the ring. And it was a great moment to see him back with Taker beating Kane. It was a great reunion moment. Uh, but it, he still had some issues. He couldn't get into the ring. Couldn't even get up the stairs, Pritchard said. Called it a bittersweet moment. So Pritchard said that they tried, and they loved, you know, they loved Bill Moody. And um, they loved him. They loved the character, but it just, they couldn't do it. It just wasn't working. And it wasn't really the company's decision, I guess, to take him off the show. It was Bearer's own decision. He had... Gale, or gallstones or something like that. Um, they don't talk about that here. I read that elsewhere. So we had some health issues. Couldn't really keep up with the road schedule. He went back home. Returned home to Alabama after leaving the company. After a very short stint in 04, they rode him off the show um, at the Great American Bash. That was when he was buried in the cement, which I don't think was ever fucking explained. It's not like Bearer turned on Taker, I don't think. Taker had to win the match against the Dudleys in order to save Bearer's life from being suffocated by like cement. He won the match, and he buried him in the cement anyway. And they kind of implied that he died, but he didn't actually die. I guess there were so many fan complaints that they eventually just uh, um, went back on that on the subsequent SmackDown and had the commentators bring up, oh, he was just seriously injured. He'll probably never be back. The injuries were that bad. So he didn't die in storyline, but he was pretty severely injured, and that was their way of writing him off. So he went on to go manage his funeral business again from that point forward. Made occasional appearance for, for uh, made occasional appearances for WWE while caring for his wife in the years that followed. Not on TV. Um, I guess he worked a couple of SmackDown ECW house shows and stuff like that, or a dark match or whatever. He would show up and address the audience in dark match form, but never on the show. Um, and that was until his wife passed away in 2009 from the breast cancer that she was previously suffering from, dating back to 2001. Um, they were married for 30 years, a huge accomplishment, he says, in this business where people really can't keep, can't keep relationships intact to save their lives. Um, but they stayed married for 30 years. And his family meant the world to him. So he kind of took you know time off from the death stuff. I mean, it, it's, it's probably pretty traumatizing when your wife passes away, and he loved her very, very much. But then you're also a funeral director, and as much as he liked doing that, I mean, it's a little weird. So he's, he stopped doing the funeral directing stuff for a while, and put the mortician business behind him, allowing him to return to WWE in 2010. Now, I remember this, and I knew who the Paul Bearer character was. I started watching in 08, so he wasn't around for the first time while I was watching until now. So he came back in 2010, 
on SmackDown, September 24th exactly. I remember watching it. I remember reading a report before it aired. Because it was back when SmackDown was taped on Tuesdays and it aired on Fridays and the crowds were fucking terrible. And it obviously meant a lot for him to come back. He said it was a cool reaction. Taker praised it. He got snuck into the building. No one had any idea until they opened the casket from Kane and he popped up and it was a great moment. It was a really, really cool moment. The thing that sucked was that the crowd, at least it came across in this way, it came across this way on TV. It was a nice reaction. It should have been a lot fucking bigger. The guy was gone for six years. It was the dumb baby face PG crowd on a tape smackdown. It was really lame. It would have been a lot better in front of a better crowd, not on a tape show, like Raw or pay-per-view or something. I thought that was fucking lame, but it was still a cool moment, and he loved coming back. The fans didn't have a clue. Taker called it great. He had a lot of fun with it. The Kane feud was what it was. I remember it being okay. I enjoyed the matches, but looking back on it now, some of those matches were not the greatest. That Hell in the Cell match fucking sucked at Hell in the Cell 2010. Uh, Bear, was that was actually where he turned uh, heel on Taker. As he should have, because Taker tried to kill him like six years earlier. So for Bear to come back at all in a line with Taker after Taker tried to kill him was questionable. But they ended up they ended up making it make sense. So from there, it kind of became like a who ki- like a who killed Kenny type of storyline, kind of referencing South Park, where every week you would think that he was written off the show when Edge tried to kill him or injure him or whatever, and then he kept coming back. And like Edge tried to injure him, he kept coming back. Kane tried to injure him, and he was gone for a while. Until he returned for a one-off on an episode of Raw, I think, in 2012. Orton kidnapped Paul Bear after Kane kidnapped Bob Orton. And he saved Paul Bear from Orton, but because Kane was a heel at the time, he threw Paul Bear into a, like a, 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 I don't know what you would call it, like a, a freezer room or something? I, don't, I forgot the exact word for it. And in storyline, he was dead, but even though he actually wasn't. So Bear always had fun with it, he always had fun with coming back. He attended the Gulf Coast Wrestling Reunion uh, in, I think, March 2nd or March 3rd, March 2nd of 2013. Three days later, dead. Passed away. And guess, I guess, at the time, the guests had said that he looked a little weak, and then he passed away three days later from a heart attack at the age of 58. Uh, Michael Hayes recalls being at a show in Albany, New York, which was a SmackDown taping. I looked it up because I-, I remember when he passed, I was... I was I'm playing like GSM trivia I'm on Twitter, or doing like a trivia session or something on my Twitter page. And right as we got done, it was around like late Tuesday night, right after the SmackDown taping went wrapped up. And SmackDown didn't air until like that Friday, of course. But I remember it was a Tuesday night. I think it was my mom's birthday. I don't remember exactly, but I'm pretty sure it was. It was right before we went out to go have cake. And then I found out that Paul Bearer died. I'm so fucking depressed. <laughs> I was I was really sad to hear that because I thought that really, really sucked. And 58 is way too young. Um, so yeah, he found out from Mark Carano, Hayes was with Vince, and Mark Carano broke the news to him, really sad stuff, so Hayes was the one who told Taker over the phone, Taker called it a big loss, Um, not only just wrestling, but as a man, I mean, he was a really, really great guy, um, Pritchard said that it was just sadness, but on, on a, you know, on a lighter note, he did get to reunite with his wife, Diane, who passed away, so, it was, you know, slightly happy in that respect, but otherwise, it was a really devastating loss to the industry and just everyone involved and who had known um, Bill Moody. Kane actually was the one who texted Foley about it um, and Foley was on his way to like a signing or an appearance or something in Indianapolis. Typed in Mobile, Alabama on his phone. It was 700 miles away. He went anyway. He said there were three people that had to be at the funeral for par- for uh, Paul Bearer, for Bill Moody. Man, it was him, it was Undertaker, and it was Kane. And all three of them, I think, went. Definitely Kane and Foley. I'm not sure if Taker was there. I'm pretty sure he was, but I'm not 100% sure. And they all ended up going. And Kane talked about being at the funeral and how people sent flowers from all over the world to pay their respects to Paul Bearer. And Paul Bearer loved being around the boys as much as he did the fans. The fans meant a lot to him. So Kane knows if, if Bearer was still alive, that that would have meant a lot to him to get all these flowers from all around the world from all these fans who uh, clearly thought the world of him. So that actually became the focal point of the Undertaker-CM Punk rivalry, which I did not think they would mention because they don't really mention CM Punk in a lot of this stuff, but they talked about how Paul Bearer passed away and Taker was already set the feud with uh, CM Punk going into WrestleMania 30, or what was it, 29 at that point in 2013. Punk actually earned the right to face Taker, which was weird. 
um, the day before Bear, Bear, Paul Bearer passed away, excuse me. Paul Bearer passed away on the Tuesday, the day after Punk and Taker was made official for Mania. So what they would have done instead, probably the typical, oh, I'm going to be the one in 21 and one, blah, 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 um, until he wasn't. But they did that instead. And at the time, I agree. Even Taker said, yeah, hey, he had say at that point in his career. Um, and he could have said, if he thought it was too disrespectful, which he did at one point, he could have just said no. And he was initially very conflicted about it, he said. But he came to the conclusion that Bear would have absolutely loved it. And they weren't even talking about Bill Moody, the person. They were talking about the character. So it wasn't too much in poor taste. They ran with it. They weren't saying, oh, like, we're glad he's dead type of thing. Like, when they did that with Eddie and with Paige's brother years ago, that was fucking dumb. Here, I thought it worked. Um, and I, again, I wasn't too high on it initially, but I agree with Taker. Bear probably would have loved it and made for a better feud. Uh, Punk made the most out of it. It was a really cool storyline. And Kane says that's exactly what Bear would have wanted. And Foley even said that he felt that it added to the match at WrestleMania, and it made for a great WrestleMania match and a great WrestleMania moment when Taker beat Punk and then paid tribute to um, Paul Bear afterward with the urn. So Bear got inducted posthumously, if that's how you pronounce the word, into the WWE Hall of Fame in the spring of 2014. Kane got to induct Paul Bear. His sons accepted the honor on their father's behalf, but it was Kane who was like the uh, presenter for, for Bear's introduction, for uh, his induction into the Hall of Fame. And he called it one of his greatest honors in his entire career. And it actually marked Taker's first appearance at anything Hall of Fame related. I don't know if he ever appeared in the crowd for those things before that. I don't think so. But he definitely never appeared on stage out of character. He was in character here, but it was still a very cool moment. The crowd popped huge when Taker's music hit after the, the family walked off. And it made it for a really cool moment for him to uh, hold up the urn and pay respect to Paul Bearer one last time. And Taker even said that he keeps his life very personal. He wasn't doing interviews at the time. But he wanted to do it to show his friend respect and be the undertaker to his Paul Bearer one last time. So to close this thing out, we hear from Taker Kane, Foley, Pritchard Hayes, and others um, one final time when they said that he got to fulfill, Bearer that is, uh, Bill Moody, got to fulfill two childhood dreams as both a professional wrestling sensation and a funeral director. What a weird combo, but he made it work and created a Hall of Fame career for himself. And Bearer himself says that he got to live a very uh, very blessed life. And um, the, the very special thing about him was that he got to combine being in the business with being a fan. He loved pro wrestling, Pritchard said. And it made him one of the greatest to ever do it. And uh, that was it. So I really, really like this special. You can check it out right now. The Mortician, the story of Paul Bear. Go check it out. I thought the people they got for it were, were perfect. Um, the stories they told were great. It does clock in at around an hour, but it flies by. A lot of stuff that I learned from this thing that, again, was already public knowledge, but I didn't. it's not like WWE talks about Paul Bear a lot. They talk about Taker and Bear or Kane and Bear, but this was really about Bear and kind of what came along with it, coming back to the company, leaving the company, his outside-of-the-ring struggles, his wife, which I did not know about, um, some really heart-wrenching stories, emotional stories, but some really funny and great stories, too. Well worth the time. Check it out right now on the WWE Network. Again, once again, the mortician, the story of Paul Bear. Great time to really honor the time, uh, the, the career, the 30-year anniversary of uh, Taker at Survivor Series coming up later this month. The timing of this thing could not have been better. So check it out right now on the network. You will not regret it. Be sure to like the video, drop a comment, share this video, and subscribe to the channel for more daily content. We will be back tomorrow with a Season 2, Episode 2 review of The Mandalorian, as presented by myself and the Doc Chris Mueller on Tuesday, Raw Talk, Wednesday, Hashtag Ask GSM. You get the drift. We got a Bianca Belair exclusive audio interview coming here to the channel, I believe, on Thursday, so keep an eye out for that. And, um, yeah, a lot to look forward to here on the channel. A lot more Taker-related content to come as well, with a Survivor Series quickly approaching, I think, in two weeks, because today's uh, November 8th as I record this. So keep an eye out for that stuff as well. Have a great one, guys. Enjoy the rest of your week slash weekend. I'm Graham Jason Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.